Hello, everyone. I welcome you here at another ADF industry session, which is a program of online case studies, creative dialogues, masterclasses, and lectures and panel discussions about current trends in documentary production and film industry in general. We usually target documentary film producers, directors, editors, composers, and other film professionals coming from the region of Central and Eastern Europe and often beyond the region as well. And uh, many of these experts and professionals are also our uh, former alumni of the SEO documentary film training programs and other activities that we organize over the year. And that's also the case of today when we are discussing here with Marian Chachia and Nick Voigt their uh, latest feature length documentary film, Magic Mountain. This is a film that was very successful in festivals, run on uh, for uh, over more than a year on festivals. Uh, now it has more than 40 uh, festival screenings, if I'm correct and also get it a numerous uh, film awards at the festivals. Uh, we are here to discuss not only this film and all the production details of it, but since it was presented at EastDoc platform in 2022, we also would like to use this as kind of like introduction to EastDoc platform and how the uh, filmmakers can benefit from visiting one of the, these markets. And uh, without further ado, I would like to introduce here Nick Voigt. Hello. And Maria Hello. 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 Thanks. Thanks. Thank for you very much for. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us. And uh, I'm really happy that we could have this discussion about Magic Mountain, which is uh, for me a very uh, visually striking, very uh, poetic, cinematic uh, documentary, and uh, one of my favorites from the last year that were released. And I'm really happy that we are also part of the. Uh, the tour that you are doing with this film now, because it's also featured not only. Uh, 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 in the ISO platform, but it's also part of the ISO account, which is the festival distribution support that we provide. And we'll be discussing all this uh, soon. But from the beginning now, let's uh, introduce this film to, to the audience. Maybe uh, some of uh, the viewers didn't see this film yet or maybe hear about it. Can you tell us a little bit more about this story about the film? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, thanks again for having us. And um, so film is my personal personal journey to the uh, Abastumani village and to the uh, tuberculosis hospital. Uh, and it's my personal story where because I am also ex-patient uh, of tuberculosis and it's discovering of this place, which was my nightmare, my biggest fear of the years. And after to visit the place, uh, meet the patients and finally meet the building, uh, building which finally will be destroyed by the oligarch. It's a film about memory. And um, I think because we spent so long making the film, um, the memory of making it and the memories that we recorded there were quite um, big in number. We captured a lot. And uh, so the final scene when the when the building is demolished gave us this opportunity to recall all these memories and i think that is one of the main themes about how important memory is to our identity as individuals but also as collectives as a nation or a society so you mentioned yourself that it's a very personal story so uh i must say i was really surprised uh, that uh, there is still a place like this for patients with tuberculosis, and it feels like something from like not this century, not even maybe the last one. So, is this still quite common, or was it like why, why uh, the tuberculosis is still treated this way in in Georgia? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, first of all, when we started making this film, that uh, it's important to mention that that time the tuberculosis was really very dangerous illness because it, it was uh, mutated and uh, there was not uh, new antibiotics in Georgia to treat. And uh, most of the patients in Abastomani Hospital were palliative patients. So it means that they were kept isolated from society, but and just uh, Abastumani hospital was just a waiting room for, for them. And um, yeah, uh, mainly the, the history of Abastumani was that uh, during the Soviet time, so it was like a village uh, where was 
eight uh, this kind of a huge uh, tuberculosis hospitals there and uh, each of the hospital has their own uh, like a patient group like uh, soldiers or kids or the from the asia and so it, it, it was like a divided with a different uh, patient but um, when we started filming all the other hospitals were demolished and it was just the last sanatorium left there um, but I think that it, it, it's not the typical way to treat people with tuberculosis anymore. And this was the last sanatorium or tuberculosis sanatorium operating in Georgia. And you can see from the inside, it's like a relic from another from another age. And even the doctors are all we're all very old, you know, from the Soviet um, era. And uh, so when the building was demolished this was also a question about where everyone went and there is a um, state-of-the-art tuberculosis center in Tbilisi um, but it's also has 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 a finite number of rooms it can't it, it's not as big as as Abastamani was um, it was really huge and it was quite amazing to see how you know in the, in, in in Soviet times they would have had people there, it would have been full. So they would have had hundreds of people staying there for up to two years at a time. You know, it was really more a, a period of getting rest. And I think the book uh, Magic Mountain by Thomas Mann is, was quite interesting to read that after visiting this place because it it was less less some of the, the, the characters or the storyline, but, but the atmosphere that this book portrays is was very tangible in, in Abbastumani. Yeah, and also I, I would add that it's important also to understand that that time Abbastumani Hospital, majority of the patients uh, came from the prison. Mm -hmm. And it was also uh, some kind of a separated, isolated place where all these people uh, were gathered. And uh, in Georgia, it wasn't any law that, for example, that everyone were allowed to leave the hospital whenever they want so uh and tuberculosis it's quite dangerous to the, and contagious illness so the structure of this building and all this like a um, place was that to build like a so everything there was like a main idea to have the family atmosphere for the doctors that because there was no security, no cameras, and no laws to keep them there. So it was more about psychological attitude from the doctors to the patients to keep them there. And uh, mainly the rule was dictated mainly by the patients and hierarchy of the patients. And uh, mm. that was also quite strange in that hospital. Yeah, it was like, I mean, it was, it was, it was like, a, I think it was a refuge for many of the patients who had spent long, a long time in, in, in prison um, and coming out didn't really have any way to integrate into society. So this place was almost a, a halfway between prison and society because there, all the patients there would have known the prison, prison rules and the, 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 the way prison works, except in Abastamani, they probably had much better food and and more freedom to to move, um, but they had to they they had to take the medication. I think that was the one rule that they had to abide by. Otherwise, they couldn't stay. But obviously, you see in the film there is one lady who is unable to take uh, antibiotics because the antibiotics the amount of antibiotics that people take was absolutely mind boggling. It's just, you know, huge handfuls and they would just knock it back and swallow it all in one. But the side effects from, from these antibiotics, what people were saying, and Mariam can testify, she, she, she's had to go through it, it was sometimes worse than the disease itself. Hmm. Maybe uh, we have a clip uh, actually that is showing this. Maybe we can play it right now. Okay. Jesus, <laughs> 
упакую сейчас тебе принесут лекарства. Спасибо. При всем при том, что мы делали, антибиотики и широкого спектра, и специфическое лечение, все равно вот такое состояние. Так что сейчас сестре скажем, она проведет, что надо на дорожку сделать. Вот так вот. Այս որիկացի վասոս մեկ ոպարի է, իսին իդա եղմարն են վասոս նիպտեպիս չալագ է բաշի։ Մի ու խետավադի միսարոմ վասոմ որից էլի գատ առակ, միսի նիպտեպիմ խոլոտ որի շարվալի, էրդի սետա, էրդի ճեմպրի, էրդի կովսի, դա որի դա� Նետա վիսու տովեպս վասո թավիս նիվտեպս։ Scenes from the film where we see, like the basically that that's the daily life there. That's how the suggestion evolves. Mm -hmm. uh, that Vasil uh, was mentioned that he was spending uh, two years in Abastumani. What was the uh, normal length of, of other patients, and also your experience? How how much time you spent there? How many years? So finally, I I wasn't patient of Abastumani. That's why it was like my biggest fear to get uh, in Abastumani because when I was diagnosed, so I was waiting what kind of a uh, answer I will get, what kind of a uh, tu tuberculosis I will have if I would if I would have the uh, if I would be a palliative patient. So then I I would be sent there. And uh, when I recovered, so it was my biggest fear that what, what it would happen if I would go to uh, Abastumani and be there. Uh, yeah, so the, uh, but mainly in Abastumani, it was like uh, people who were spending years because that most of the people were with a really mm, hard cases of tuberculosis there. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, some people were home, like, um, without uh, home, anything. So it was some kind of a shelter for them. And there was one person who spent uh, more than seven years there, uh, mm -hmm. not only in Abastubani, but in Abastumani and in Tbilisi. So going uh, 
in these two hospitals. Tuberculosis um, develops a resistance to antibiotics, and, and this has really made, uh, given TB, uh, quite a comeback. Because it used to be, also when I found out about Marika's illness, um, I was quite surprised that tuberculosis was still a thing. And after researching a little bit more, I found out that it's not just a thing, it's one of the main main killers still today, um, especially in, in, in developing countries and, and uh, places where there's more poverty, there is more tuberculosis. And the uh, multi-drug resistance form of TB is quite difficult to treat. And that's why people take so many antibiotics, because they're just basically using a scattergun approach to try everything and see if something works. But then there is XDRTB, which is extreme drug resistant tuberculosis. And this is practically impossible to treat at the moment because depending on its strain, it's already resistant to all known antibiotics. So it's it, this means that people just stay there and wait until new new drugs appear or to new treatment uh, strategies come forward. And it's during this time, people don't take their medication because it's pointless. So there's the tuberculosis is just working on them. And in the hospital, there were two floors, one for uh, people who are contagious and one for people who are not contagious anymore. Um, but from our experience, we, the people were mixing freely regardless of these flaws. And um, this, this, this was just really just, uh, you know, an idea, but it, in, in practice, it didn't really work. So I think also the fact that people were allowed to leave the, the sanatorium whenever they wanted to go into the village or to get a, a, a minibus to the city or to, the, to their family for the weekends, and then they would come back. So the spreading of tuberculosis was not helped by this um, institution. Yeah, I think the biggest problem was, I think it's less now, but to understand and realize this illness mm -hmm. and to prevent from this illness. So that uh, for, for the patients, they don't really uh, understood that why they need to be apart from the family, why they need to be like a more responsible to society. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Also, the stigma is a massive thing because there, uh, this is something left over very much from the Soviet Union. That's, that's also for me as a, an, a, a Westerner living in, in Georgia and, uh, or in, like in this post-Soviet um, place. It took, took quite a while to understand the full extent to which this stigma or stigmatization of people who are sick is so deeply ingrained in, in, in very many people in society. And, and it's something that's still quite difficult to shake off. You know, the idea that you may have recovered from tuberculosis um, and you have no straight, no, no, uh, you're not contagious at all, but people still will be very cautious of mixing or socializing with you or being anywhere near you once they find that out through some irrational fear. And this, this, is, this is also interesting that this fear and this stigma spreads the illness even more because people don't want to talk about it. People don't want to discuss it. Um, and they hide. And they hide. Yeah. So they'd rather hide and spread the illness rather than coming out and being um, labeled as, as uh, sick, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You already mentioned this, this stigma in a way that when you said that uh, Abastoma is a quite isolated place and uh, it's among the four uh, woods uh, away from uh, the eyes of the general public. But what happens uh, to, to the patients? Because you mentioned that the building is no longer there. It was destroyed at the end, also in the film. But uh, what happened to the patients? Have they been relocated to the Tbilisi, to the new hospital, or what happened to them? Yes, so uh, there, there, there is one hospital built, but not on the same place, so a little bit like uh, outside of Apostopani, but the patients, uh, but it's not for this like uh, tuberculosis patients, it's more like a retreat. It's a, re it's a retreat center for um, a pulmonary uh, respiratory treatment center. Yeah, but the patients uh, from Abastumani Hospital, which we were filming, so they were sent to Tbilisi Hospital, 
and some of them at home and some of them left Georgia and got treatment in Europe. Don't think there was uh I don't think there was any system to this. It, what we understood, we were filming on and off for five years. We would go back um once a year at least and and, and uh sometimes more. But towards the end, we got a phone call from Omar. We got a phone call from one of the patients to say that they were uh, given one one hour to pack all their stuff, and there was a coach that took them away. And that's when we came back, and that's when we understood that the the building had been sold and the demolition was was in the pipeline. And that's yeah. So we we don't really know accurately what happened to all of the patients. Uh, it's mm. all based on hearsay. Did you manage to track some of them, or did you try to to find where they are? Well, one 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 patient actually came to our premiere in uh, in in the Tbilisi Film Festival. Um, while we were shooting it, Natia, the, the the woman with blonde hair, short blonde hair that she, that appears in the film. Yeah, and I, I still have a good like a relationship with some of the patients, but uh, two of them, and they are in Germany. They stayed in Germany. They got a treatment there, and they're fine now. That's good. So, do you think like this film could also change the way how uh, general public is looking at people with tuberculosis, and also like breaking the stigma, or also uh, contribute to better conditions for the patients? Yeah, I, I think I think so because also that uh, I was one of the first uh, ex patient in in Georgia who openly said that yes, I had tuberculosis because it was such big stigma even to for the ex patients to to speak about this was really difficult. I think now it's a little bit better even with the stigma because now there are some new French medicines who like new antibiotics who might uh, like uh, uh, treat. Uh, tuberculosis patients but of course that when we speak about the problem then there is a hope that uh, this uh, stigma will be like uh, overcome and something will be better and uh, yeah mm. I, I i hope so yeah that, that uh, also that uh, when we started uh, making this film the main idea was uh, to break the stigma and to start speaking about the illness we in the beginning we didn't really plan to make a big film uh, and like uh, making uh, to make uh, to to follow for five years uh, like at uh, the building but <clears throat> Our main idea was to make like a short film about patients, about their life and where I can speak about my illness. And that was the main idea mm -hmm. to tackle stigma. But of course, when we went to Abbas Tumani, it was like a totally different world. And we were really like a, uh, amazed about this. And after we continue following, going back all the time, and we understood that it's not just a short film about stigma but also it's like a bigger and uh, deeper idea mm -hmm. i really like the way how you portray the people there and the situation because it's very intimate very authentic and also very uh uh like sharing the understanding to, to the people it's not like uh, you're just portraying them but you really understand that the stigma has to be broken so i really up, uh, like this approach and uh, Let's stay on the creative side for a while because you, uh, in a way, uh, the whole film is presented as a fairy tale. In a way, it starts with a voiceover. You are also talking about how magical this place is. And uh, so, when did this idea came from? Uh, like, what was uh, like when you decided to make it as a kind of like a contemporary fairy tale about this place? Yeah, I, I think it was like a most difficult part of the film to understand that so uh, when i will uh, when i became uh, when i was ready to um, record the voiceover and agree that yeah film needs the voiceover because it for for a long time i i tried to avoid the voiceover and nick was all the time pushing that this film really needs your voiceover it needs your story and i finally yeah uh, it was uh, finally we tried and we understood that this is something what really needs. And also it was important that I think that uh, when a building was also destroyed, we understood that it's not uh, really on patient's life. So the main characters are me and Abbas Tumani and how our 
like a, I don't know how our stories are split and they are they were so similar mm -hmm. because it, me as an ex patient were hiding my illness and try to avoid and I think that Abastumani Hospital also uh, was uh, some kind of uh, example how in Georgia we always try to forget our past and to just erase past and not don't, not think about unpleasant past and. These like two fact, facts that my my history I try to forget and the history of Abastumani, which might be for, for forgotten. So this was some kind of a similar uh, sto similar context, and that was when I, we understood that somehow main characters should be me and Abastumani, and of course that voiceover mm -hmm. and this like uh, this uh, na narrative style was. I think it's I think it's what we found when the building started to become a character in itself was that there was a huge challenge that that presented to us in how do we animate or bring to life an inanimate object it's when you're there you feel the atmosphere you feel it's alive somehow but how do you give it a personality that, that, that an audience can follow and i think that that was that was the biggest challenge that we had during editing and and this form of the voiceover as in in, in terms of uh, addressing the building as a person helped very much and and also this this kind of led us into the i suppose the fairy tale um style as well that it was it just kind of flowed after that but it it, it took quite a long time to get to this point and a, quite a lot of sweat and yeah. blood and <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> yeah, a lot of disagreements as well. Yeah, but 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 eventually, it's after we figured that out, it flowed quite easily after that. I agree. Like with voiceover, sometimes it could be very tricky and it would shift the film in a completely different direction. But here, it was perfect because I think that's the personal aspect and the, the intimacy that is around this and the connection you have to us the building. It worked very well in this case. So, really, really good decision. I think and it was also important when, because when we had a voiceover and it was something like we felt that something is not really correct. And finally, one day Nick said, that's okay, let's rewrite it. And he, he changed it. Uh, and that, so it, it wasn't just uh, my story because that I was speaking in a, like a third person, the whole, whole my story. And Nick, when it was rewritten and it was like a letter to Abastumani, then I think everything uh, was really like, uh, felt really correct. Mm -hmm. So bit fairy tales, so let's, let's uh, stay with that for a while. But I don't think that we could say there is a happy end as in a fairy tale, but uh, not every fairy tale has a happy end. So uh, there's always some kind of like moral lesson learned. Kind of. So do you think like there is some lesson learned from this? I, well, moral, I don't know if it's a moral lesson, but definitely there is a message that we try to leave the audience with in the end um, that this that we should have um, ability to know our own history and and have our own memories as a society, as a country, as 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 individuals, um, because this is so directly linked to our identity and our identity is important without identity we're just tools for whoever whoever is in power and i think that's the most important message for for me personally anyway in in, in the film and i know that anyone who watches it can take anything they they want from it but that was something that when as we made the film because it was such a long process um we followed the building on this journey and we discovered its past. And we also found out that many people in Georgia didn't know the story of this building. So in a way, what we did with the film was to make a record of this building, a document that will last hopefully longer than it did. Um, and, and, and people in the future will be able to watch this and know that it existed and know this little aspect of, of, of Georgian history. And that in itself it helps people shape their identity and know who they are and where they're from. 
Yeah, and I, I, I would add that I always like that it's mostly um, during all the Q&As when we show the film, it's always a question that, is it bad that the building was destroyed or is it good? Because it, this is, I, I think also that we don't really say that how it should be but this question which audience always carry it, it's important to think because of course it wasn't like a great hospital it wasn't mm. maybe good treatment there and conditions were really bad but on the same time to understand that this was like a georgian heritage and mm -hmm. these questions that what we should how we should treat our history how we should treat our heritage maybe for some people maybe it's fine to destroy but uh, there is a question. Maybe we should, I don't know, make a should should have make a museum there. Maybe it wasn't good for hospital, but to keep it as a uh, memory of our past or something. So this is also a question which is important that people always have. I think also when you, I mean, if we take it further, uh, even more, Georgia has a border with um, a few very big, powerful countries. Um, and uh, especially Russia, and the this influence of Russia from when this building was built um, is something that Georgians uh, live with even now. But the people also are afraid that it will come again at some point, you know. And 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 that's it's very important to know what the what the past um, brought in order to be aware if that ever happens again and also prevent it happening again. And I think that's that's also why we have this phrase at the end of the film about the the future being predictable and and and, and but the fast the past being unpredictable. And um this is quite an interesting idea because when people in power have the ability to change the past in a way, what they have in their hands is your, the, you are they, exactly they have your identity in your hands and they can do it in their hands and they can do whatever they like with it. You're just like a toy in this in this respect. But if people know their own history and people know their own past, then nobody can reshape them or, or, or change or brainwash them or use them for whatever they like. People know their worth and know their identity and know their past this makes people powerful in, in, in the face of, of uh, oppressive rulers. And, and, and there's no, it's no surprise that uh, dictators and oppressive rulers, the first thing they do is make sure that they control the nation's identity and that people aren't able to freely remember or freely think. Um, so I suppose that is the main topic here because we've got also uh, some kind of oligarchy in Georgia where we have one person at the top who's basically invisible, but very, very powerful. And so it was also quite um, interesting to approach this topic, obviously, because he was the one that knocked down the building in the end. Um, but, you know, he didn't do it under his own name. He did it under a few companies removed. And it's all it's all done, you know, like quite sneakily behind uh, this and that and a few different curtains, a few different smoke screens. But ultimately, everything comes back to this one guy. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and when you have a small country, it's easier to have a, a lot of power and ultimate power as well. Um, and he obviously likes to use it. I mean, he's, he, he can really do whatever he likes in Georgia. So. This was also a challenge for us. How do we approach this without, you know, coming out and directly uh, offending or criticizing uh, this person, but still at the same time showing the actions and and the repercussions of of, of these actions. Yeah. And during the uh, okay, working on a voiceover, we were like thinking a lot how or should we include even like a phrases about oligarch or just to leave because it, it's obviously, we can see that the, the building is demolished, but after we, we thought that it's important also to say, because it's uh, besides that it's a film and it's beautiful film. It's also a very big document. What what's happened. So for us, it was uh, like a decision that yes, we need to, we need to say who, who, who did it and why he did it, that it, it became his own private villa. Because it, 
uh, maybe, I don't know, for the next generation, it should be a good document what might happen if you will give too much power to one man. Mm -hmm. yeah. Maybe we could watch the second clip, which is actually about the, just the end of the building in a way. So let's watch it, please. Patarakha, su patara, dakis ki sepcha lepshi. Si kwarulis, shen raid si je. Gamir bi khar me malebi, mi khar khar da me khare bi she. Kholot she. Modi, 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 čem tam čemo ime do. So here we saw the last moments of Abbas uh, Also, I also really like the way how we work with the camera. And also that brings me to questions. How did you divide it to roles of this project? Because you were both as, um, great as the directors and editors. Uh, mm -hmm. Nick, you're also uh, by profession a cinematographer. Uh, Mariam, you also uh, take care of this project as a producer. So how did you decide who will do what? And uh, was it really because of small team and uh, how you had the strategy plan for this film? I don't think we started out with any clearly defined roles. I mean, I, I was uh, shooting 
uh, Mariam was doing sound sometimes um, and, and mainly talking to people. And um, so I just, we just followed, I mean, I followed her, I followed the patients and as we continued working, we had uh, more clearly defined roles um, that, 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 that just developed over time. I think that um, directing together was, um, was interesting and, and and I think partly part of the reason it took such a long time to make might have been that we're we're both directing and trying to find a form uh, and tell a story that, that uh, we both can get behind and that we both feel is part of us was a challenge but at the same time I think it brought out many more opportunities in, in, in terms of how we can tell the story than, than we would have had each working alone. Um, yeah, I mean, we definitely there was a part of necessity about it um, because it took us quite a long time to get this film funded. So we did a lot of it ourselves through necessity, but... Um, yeah, and yeah. I think also that mainly because of a limited budget, mm. that was also that, of course, the place also in Abastumani, it was impossible to yeah. go with a lot of people, but even to have a sound person with us, it would be really good. But mm -hmm. it was very difficult project to do. So we sometimes we were just receiving some message and next day we were just going there. So it was impossible to plan with a group, but as we were doing everything together, so it was easier to navigate and make this film. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And after in the end, so we also started editing the film because it was so 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 much material, and mm. we understood that. And again, we didn't have a lot of money for the post production, so we started editing by ourselves. And after, so our um, friends and good advisors, editors joined the project, and they they helped us also to shape and make uh, interesting uh, form of. I mean, we had four hundred and fifty hours of footage more or less and each time we came back to editing we had to watch it all again you know so so this 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 I think was a, also a massively challenging aspect because when you know when you've been there and you filmed it yourself in a way you have this um, idea that you already you already know what footage you have and but but well you can't trust your memory in uh, so accurately um the shot at the end of the film, for example, I I just remember having this shot of the dust going up the up the mountain, but it was only towards the end that I I, I looked at the clip and realized that I'd filmed the last part of the building being knocked down before that. So it was really important to sit down and, and, and watch everything again every single time we came back to editing. And we spent about four years editing on and off. And it was important for us to go away and spend a little bit of time without the project so that we could come back to it with new eyes. And, and, and this was something that I was quite difficult because it just dragged the process out even more. Um, but I think it was very necessary for us to be able to come back um, and, and see it as, as a, a new thing. Yeah, but also it's fair to mention that I think in 2018, we finished the film, we edited with our French editor, Céline Pelapikis, and after we heard that, so the building will be sold. And we understood that, so all this work, we need to move and continue filming. And mm -hmm. uh, of course, and it, it wasn't, we, we didn't have any money for <clears throat> for shooting, for anything. So it was also that we, we knew that we need to do it everything by, by ourselves. But that was essentially, yeah, I mean, I... It was a good decision. It was a good decision. I, I, we, I often joke the reason we we spent five years filming there is because we couldn't find an ending. You know, we just kept kept going, and almost every time we went there, there would be some different patients, new patients. Then the, the old ones would have gone or died, and so it was very difficult for us to find uh, a character with a narrative that we could follow, which is what we had been looking for previously. But it was too elusive, and so the building naturally became a character, and then. Then the doctors and nurses became characters as well, though um, they were more, you know, like uh, characters in relation to the building. And then it, everything became in relation to the building. So when we found out that it was going to be demolished, then it was, you know, the 
it was very natural and it, and it was a gift for the film um so so the patience paid off in the end that that we we knew we didn't have the ending and 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 finally when it came then it was very clear that we understood yeah that's it and yeah. and and now it's easier to tell the story from that point going backwards and then finding a way to end here hmm. well not the best ending for the building but the great no. ending for the film definitely Mm. And let's say a little bit more about the production side. So I mentioned that you came to Prague uh, to eat a pot in 2020. It was already in a, a later stage. And as you just say now, with complete new edit. So how this this help you to uh, finish the film and what was the experience you had there? So it, it massively helped us. Yeah. That's the first thing and to first say. First of yeah. all, uh, um, uh, I want to say that the Avastumani, the project Magic Mountain, have been in a lot of platforms and the pitchings. But I think that East Dock, the East Dock market was the most uh, productive, uh, and without this, it would be it wouldn't be done. Because, would I still be making it? <laughs> yeah, I guess because there where we. First of all, it, it was very important that we started again pitching and speaking with the people. And it was very nice. We, we had a lot of uh, meetings and we every meeting was so productive because the people had very nice comments or questions. So they it wasn't just a meeting that's just uh, wasting our time. Mm-hmm. It was very important. And uh, what was also most important that we met our co-producer there it's a uh, polish tv and uh, so after after a year we we signed a contract and without uh, polish money polish co-production it would be impossible to make the yeah. post-production of the film and that's i mean we we managed to do the production ourselves because we didn't we didn't pay ourselves for the vast majority of the work but with with the editing the same but with the other aspects of post-production the sound and the color and the and, and the and the um you know all, all the other aspects uh, also the, the the sound design the foley which was also part of it yeah. which are really crucial aspects to bringing this atmosphere alive in the film um this experience that we had in 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 in, uh, in prague was uh, very crucial to bringing this film um alive though like bringing it to to fruition because we we had pitched this project I don't know how many times. I mean, more than I can 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 remember. Um, over the course of five years, five six years, and it became a routine. But I think we we had a little gap before we came to Prague, and um, and so it was a fresh. And also the story was different. And we it was very easy the way everything set up. I think what I really like about about it was that with these roundtables. Mm-hmm where you go and you sit and you discuss your project with people and people were all really very interested, even if they couldn't help financially or, or in any other way. Mm-hmm. It was the sharing of experiences that that, that made it as such an interesting um, trip for us. And we, we, we came back, mm-hmm. I think, quite enriched because of that. And that, that's also important that uh, besides the, for example, financial partner and co-producers, uh, it was very good to meet some people who helped us after with the film. For example, that we met also uh, Leila Dedik, who invited us after the uh, Al Jazeera pitching, uh, pitching. So it was very important for us to be there because we also uh, won two awards, one, one um, from um, IDF that... Uh, a distribution uh, award and from current time we met the people who after remembered our pitching pitching so it, they were curious how we, we will finish the film and the, when the fi- film was finished so we were invited in different festivals so i think it was yeah very very, very good for us great so i would like to ask also like did you have a like production strategy because we don't usually, everyone is talking about festival strategy, like thinking from the beginning where you would like to premiere it, which way you would like to go. But did you have the same thing with the production, like the markets where you want to present it, where you want to pitch it? Because you mentioned that you pitched it already before, but mm-hmm. was it more like organic or did you already have in, in mind some places where you would mm-hmm. like to present it? And then maybe it will be invited again as a completed film. Mm, so mainly what I want to say that uh, uh, I am... As a producer, I am like a self-taught producer, uh, to say. 
And I think Abastumani was for me the biggest uh, exercise to become producer because when we started, I was just applying everywhere. I was just trying to pitch everywhere, which is not really good. I understood. Now I understood that you need to really choose the platforms and like you, you choose the festivals. You need to know where where is your your target audience, what you want to get from that uh, pitchings. So in the beginning, we we were pitching everywhere, like in Hong Kong and in, I don't know in France, everywhere, and. Uh, um, without any strategy, without any planning. And after we understood that, so also this like uh, too much pitchings also uh, totally empty us yeah. from inside. And we understood- You get that fatigued. It, so yeah, and, and there's only so many times you can have the same conversations with, with people about, you know, why they are unable to work with this project or why it's not right for them yeah. exactly and, and, and so on. And I think it's, yeah. It's important to have the a target, I guess. And after yeah. that's why we had like a big gap be, before Prague, uh, before East Dog Market, that we knew that we don't want to just pitch somewhere. So we, we knew that we need to find a place where we will meet the uh, good potential partners. And we knew that it was very specific project to understand. And uh, we needed the like a... Uh, partners who can really understand the, the subject, maybe like a post-Soviet system, what was happening. And that's why we have to choose like a East Dog market to come and meet people because we knew that people there will be more uh, aware what's happening in Georgia, culturally, how, how it goes. And it was, yeah, it was do, and do you see like the markets as a like the visiting markets as an important thing in uh, follow up uh, on the meetings and negotiation further, or do you feel like uh, now you try to select few strong markets where you know you will get what you need and that's it? Or so what? What do you see is is better for you? Uh, and now, for example, with the new projects, uh, I already know that which markets will be good for specifically that project. And I don't think that uh, every market is good for the project because it's sometimes, uh, it, of course, if you don't want to visit the country and see like more countries, it's sometimes it's pointless and it's not good always to to have too much pitching, pitchings and like uh, meetings with the project. You need to keep, but it's very important. I don't mean that it's very important to go and present your project because if you don't present, people are not aware that you are doing something. So you need already some people to uh, for, to wait your, your film, final film, but uh, I am now I'm very careful where I am sending and which platforms I'm choosing for that project. I think, for, I mean, I'm not a producer, but uh, from my point of view, going to markets is um, it's, it's good to have have clear expectations of what you what can happen there. Initially, I always would go to the markets thinking uh, we need money to make this film. That's 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 just a. Uh, the basics of how, how this is has to work otherwise we can't finish a film um and in invariably it wouldn't it wouldn't it never works like that no one writes you a check and says here you go go finish your film and and then after a while i realized that, that that's not the most valuable thing that you can get from 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 these experiences because there are so many people in the industry who are making films who are enabling films who are fin financing films or working on films themselves and this is a really great place to share your experience and to make friends as well and make uh, co colleagues and contacts and widen your circle within the industry because often it's a very lonely profession, uh, being a producer or a director or, or, or filmmaker um, because you're so much involved in your topic and your subjects and your projects that uh, this sharing of your experience i think is 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 quite liberating in a way and then when you meet people over time then you you never know how these people might come back into your life at some point and especially when you meet them at a different festival or a different market later on then then it, it the, everything just becomes a little bit more manageable and i think that's that's definitely the most valuable aspect of it is 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 being part of uh, an industry it's not huge. Let's say, I mean, it's, 
the documentary industry in 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 Europe is, isn't massive compared to other industries, you know. But but it's it's uh, I think also very important to to know people in there and 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 also present your project, present yourself, and to be part of it. <clears throat> I think yeah. Yep. So it's really important to to make these connections, uh, and it's great that you're saying that that it's not just the money; it's really about the connections you make, and uh, mm -hmm. that will lead to other opportunities in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, you met lots of sales agents on the way as well, but if I'm correct, the film doesn't have a sales representative. Mm -hmm. How do you explain that? Despite the huge festival success, it was just uh, last autumn. It was at Itfa's Best of Fest section. So. How do you explain this? Like, why do you think there is no sales interest in this? I, I have a good news that I have a good news that uh, two days ago I signed the contract with a sales uh, split screen. So ah, yeah. we, finally, we have now. But we, have, we didn't need one before. That, I think that's the main thing. I mean, and and also it wasn't no. I, I think we we want the but, silver caravan. Yeah. But the silver caravan uh, award that we won in um, Sarajevo, I think was a huge help in bringing this film to audiences. And um, I don't think we can really underestimate that as well. That's, that, that was a massive, a massive job. And also the by the time the film was out, uh, we had already contacts um, who would screen the film. We already had uh, festivals asking for the film and it just kind of got, I mean, we did try with sales agents, but it was nothing. It just—I don't think it was right for anyone. It wasn't right yeah. for us, and 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 I think it's, I think it's so important as well because we have had a couple of, let's say, difficult experiences with sales agents where the our expectations and their expectations didn't, um, weren't able to meet, um, and and I think we learned from that that we will only get a sales agent if we are able to feel that our expectations will be met through that yeah, otherwise otherwise we don't we don't really have to have one just for the sake of having one you know and that's important but also that i think that magic mountain uh, is not really commercial film or the film which might be uh like sold easily because it's a more like a festival film of course, now it it is easier because because of this film. So the film uh, we we have like uh, all this threat from the Minister of Culture and all this like a crazy situation. So of course now it's some kind of a uh, more interest to the film. But before it was just uh, too artistic uh, film. We didn't make the film to be political. I don't think at any point that had that was in our intentions, but. In Georgia, at least, the film very quickly became political, yeah. um, and and that, I mean, personally, took me by surprise a little bit. But but it's something we've we've that has definitely uh, caused quite a buzz around the film, and people uh, want to see it. Every screening we've had in Georgia has been packed out. I mean, there's no seats available. People sitting on the stairs and standing up at the back. So there is a there is a huge interest and. Um, of course, we screened it outside Georgia first, it, and 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 the film did win some awards, and this was reported in Georgia. But this wasn't enough to to really pique people's interest. It was when it was when the it started to make a few people un, in power uncomfortable. Then people thought, ah, yeah, maybe there's something more in the film than just pretty shots mm -hmm. and poetic story, you know. And and um, so that is the situation at the moment but the the i think it, in georgia there's a um, has been quite a clamp down on on, on the culture and uh, freedom of expression and uh, mariam will tell you more about that but the the minister of culture of georgia came out on tv and felt that it was necessary to uh, criticize our film openly um and and and, and this was uh, in a way quite um I, I don't know. I mean, it, it, for, for me, a little bit, uh, it felt funny, you know, the, the, why why someone in this position should feel the need to uh, isolate one film. But obviously, it's clear why, because of the oligarch portrayed in the film. And 
the that was why she had to come out and say something uh, about our film because he doesn't like to be portrayed anywhere you know he likes to to be invisible mm. in a sense but the problem is in georgia when you are so powerful if you do anything properly and you dig deep enough you will always find traces of the oligarch because he's omnipresent in that in in, in that respect in, in in every sphere so it's impossible not to come up against him at some point um, so, yeah, so well, it, it, we, we had really, as Nick said, that we had very, very big interest and uh, it was always packed. But the problem now is that after the uh, this, like a uh, criticizing, uh, after the criticism and the threat from the minister, we now we're not able to screen the film. Uh, uh, it was just twice uh, the like, two organizations contacted me and they or they asked me to screen the film, but secretly without any announcement. Uh, they will the, they they will bring the audience by themselves. But uh, even though that there is a big interest in Georgia, we can't. We don't have a space to to screen the film. No, but we we will try and screen it on uh, on, TV. on TV. Yeah. Um. On 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 the opposition. Oppos opposition television. Hopefully, we'll screen it. Mm. Um. And bring it to an even wider audience in in Georgia. And this is the at the moment the 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 main criticism that is being. Um, directed at the Minister of Culture that is that she's trying to censor. Um, films or try and sen try to censor culture in general and I think that the, if you try and censor filmmakers then you have to expect that they're going to make films and 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 their films uh, that's because that's that's what that's what we do right it's you can't stop people doing what they do and unless you physically do it but the, the, at the moment there is quite a strong movement um, in Georgia and the filmmakers are together um, in 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 resistance to this, so it's it's uh, it's tense. But in at, at the same time, people are aware of how important their freedom of expression is and how important culture is as well. Um, and and documentary films are are a massive aspect of of uh, culture and identity of people too. Yeah, this uh, the main main target also for the government is documentary films. Mm. But what I want to say that. So uh, after this film, I think they also use this film that they will change the uh, rules uh, in Georgian National Film Center that no one will be able to change the uh, script, script script for oh, documentary script for documentary. This is this is also comic. I mean, it's as though we have like the mystical powers to predict the future, and we will know exactly when it's going to rain and what someone will say. You know. It's, yeah, because that, that, that was a main uh, main subject of a threat that uh, the film was financed by Georgia National Film Center in 2015. But uh, of course, we didn't know that the uh, building will be demolished. So it wasn't in the treatment. We didn't include this part and last part. But they were really angry that finally we we screen we we showed this uh, this action and now so they announced that they might uh, make this like a uh, rules uh, um, uh, much more stricter that no one will be able to change anything in documentary films and I think it's a uh, also this uh, like a uh, whole interview uh, by the minister. It wasn't only directed to me, but also to the maybe to the young the young filmmakers because mm -hmm. they can't do anything because we all know that all this threat that she will take me to the court, etc. So it's um, it's well, nonsense. Were, there were veiled threats. Yeah, it's nonsense. But just I think that it it was a message to the young filmmakers to say that if you will do something critical, if you will do something what we don't like so we will take you to the court so mm. it, and i think it, this is more danger than to criticize the film yeah absolutely i mean that that we we, we make films for people to freely criticize that's you know that everyone has a right to express their opinions about a film but but the uh, intimidating this intimidation uh, of, of 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 people on live on tv is something that uh feels like it's from another century as well you know it, yeah. it feels very old-fashioned and very um yeah I, I mean it feels like a blunt tool that they're using and also it, it clearly demonstrates that, that that something has got under their skin you know that, mm -hmm. that the film hasn't had an effect 
um, in in higher places, and 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 maybe that's also a good thing because <clears throat> now the film in itself has 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 taken on a life of its own, which is also very peculiar. You know, you spend so long making the film, and now it's it's being used by people left, right, and center to to demonstrate different political points of view, to demonstrate certain. Um, to be part of uh, activists uh, uh, and, and, and and demonstrations and so on. And, and people are referring to the film in, and using it in, in, in ways that I have, or we have no control over. And, yeah. and that's fascinating. It's very interesting to watch. And I know this is not the first case because this has happened also to Saul Mayashi with Taming the Garden, which is yeah. the same problem, the same person behind it. So. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's the same oligarch who is, <laughs> who is doing all these things. Yeah. Right? And I know that just recently, the, after Berlin Halle, it was introduced to the new Georgian Film Institute, which is an independent organization. And uh, I know that this is supposed to be the representation of uh, not only documentary filmmakers, but everyone who would like to be independent on this yeah. influence as well. Yeah, and this uh, this uh, Georgian Film I I Institute now is a very big hope for us because it, uh, uh, Georgian National Film Center is promoting and helping to the certain people who are pro pro government mainly, and so now uh, this like a mostly but with the, this like a mood the Georgian movement like a filmmakers movement and the activists. Uh, made this uh, Georgian Film Institute. Of course, it's open for everyone. It's not only for the people who are boycotting Georgia National Film Center or who are in the, this activism now. It's uh, it's open for every filmmaker. Uh, and uh, I do hope that uh, with a now now as an institution, uh, Georgian Film Institute will become strong strong because we had very interesting uh, presentations at Berlinale, and we we. We see it like a really like a hope as a dog a documentary association in Georgia. I mean, I don't remember. I mean, I, I I've been living in Georgia for nine years, and I don't remember a year like we've had now with uh, Georgian documentary films. It's been a very strong year, and it's very interesting that it's coincided just as the Minister of Culture decides to put the brakes on everything and 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 try to interfere with it because. It's really put uh, Georgian documentary cinema on the map. And I think it's very important that institutions like the Film Institute and DOCA are uh, active now to be able to actually benefit from, from, from these films and, and bring more um, and allow filmmakers to also have the opportunity to continue making great films. I think that's very important um, for yeah. the country industry. And we are actually running out of time because it will be great to discuss this more because there's lots of uh, to discuss, especially around the situation. And I remember the screening in Batumi where your film was very uh, nicely uh, received by the audience and there was big discussions and everything we discussed here now was, was mentioned there as well. So I can just say like, good luck with uh, your film because it's still traveling. So for those who didn't see the film, maybe you still have a chance to see it at other festivals around you. And mm. I wish you also good luck with uh, the situation in Georgia, and we hope that it will change for the better soon. And we are here also to support you more. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for your time, for your nice words. And uh, thank, you. Thank, you. thank you very much. Yeah, it was our pleasure. Thank you.